Welcome to my first talk about an introduction to GNU Linux in education. It's such an honor to be here at Dev, uh, DevConf today. It's my first time, so I hope you'll understand everything I'm saying. My name is Rafael Mateus. I'm an IT student engineer, uh, an IT engineering student from Universidad Complutense de Madrid, and I'm also a member of the community LibreLab UCM, in which we promote free software and also cybersecurity by doing events, giving speeches, giving talks. So I invite you to join us. Well, let's begin. First, I'm going to show you a little index about things you're going to see, like for example, these ones. You're going to learn what's GNU, what's Linux, what's free software. You're also going to learn the different types of users. Don't think it's a professional way. I'm going to ex just ex tell you the meaning of the root user, privileged users with sudo commands, and also non-privileged users. I'm also going to show you some of the desktop environments, and I'm also going to show you how to install, upgrade, and update the software you install on your computer. I'm also going to show you some of the alternatives you can use on your computer by using Nextcloud, and also some, some, some of the things that you can use on your daily life that are open source. That's the main point. Let's begin. Who's this man? Who's this animal? This man, this man is Richard Stallman. Richard Stallman is the founder of the GNU project. What is the GNU project? GNU was born in 1984 as a project to promote free software. As a project to promote free software. In a way that uh, until that time, most of the operating systems were non-free. What do I mean when I say non-free? Those systems were closed ones, and developers couldn't see the source code, so it couldn't be reused on other machines, just some, some, some specifically machines, not all of them, so what's the point? That's why Richard Stallman decided that he wanted to make a system that was 100% free, not just 95% free, as he said. So he developed the GNU, on the GNU, uh, the GNU project system, and he also started developing a kernel, which is like the core of a system. And that kernel is named Herd. Uh, it keeps being supported by the community and obviously run by the Free Software Foundation, which is also a foundation he developed to share free software. Wait a minute, now I'm going to show you what's actually free software. Free software has four principles. These principles are the next ones I'm gonna to, I'm gonna tell you about. Okay, let's wait a, wait a minute. I'm gonna I'm gonna just read actually the actual definition of each one so that you can get what they actually are. The first one is the freedom to run a program as you wish for any purpose. For example, you could run yeah that's it. I mean that's an easy definition for the first principle. The freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish. That's the freedom number one. Access to the source code is a precondition to the forties. That's a cool one. The third one is the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help others. That's the freedom number two. Number three, sorry. Wait. And then the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. And by doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes. Now I'll give you a real example of what happens when you are in free software and when you are in proprietary software. You are a company. You buy something, some kind of software, some piece of software that works with data from your clients. That program one day stops being maintained by the company. I mean, you are the only one that you're still using it because I mean, you pay for it. Why don't why don't you keep using it? If it's working fine, but someday, as a company that was developing it stops giving support and updates, one day one client um, complains about some error that you had that he had on something. What do you tell him? I mean, okay, probably you can fix it doing something, but not touching the code. So what do you do? I mean, you lose that client. What do you do? You can't do almost anything. You are in a closed box where you are locked and you can get outside of that box. That's why we need free software, because in free software you could see the code, change the code, debug the code, you could see what's happening inside of that box, you could get outside of that box, destroy the box and fix the issue, so both 
uh, everyone's happy, not just you, everyone's happy. That's one of the main points of free software. I mean, if you develop something and it's free software, people can improve it. Uh, you can learn with other people too. I mean, if there is there's a project, there are 100 people working on it, I'm pretty sure that someone that something you learn. Even if you are the best, something you learn. And also, most of free software projects are community driven, which gives which gives them a feeling or a sense of community, and also, as I always say, sharing. Sharing is important in education, and software used in high school schools and also college should be free software, or at least they should try to support it, not just say, okay, let's use private tools and not use anything of free software. But that's my opinion. So now let's see a bit, let's go backwards and see a bit again of uh, what's, what, where were we? We were that GNU is an operative system that was born in 1984, founded by Richard Salmon because he wanted a Unix-like operative system that was 100% completely free, due to the things I've told you about, the principles of the Free Software Foundation. So he did it, he did it, he had it almost done. And then in 1991, Linus Torvalds developed the Linux kernel on his small computer. He started building his own kernel, which was Linux kernel. Linux and Stallman, they had each each of them had different things. One had a kernel, one had the GNU tools, so they joined them. And then GNU started being called GNU Linux. Almost every computer running GNU Linux. Basically, it's like, I don't know what's the percentage, but GNU is obviously the bigger part. The kernel, the, what's a kernel? A kernel is actually something that um, computes and manages all the things uh, that need to run with hardware. I mean, I mean, it controls the sharing of the resources, like processes, memory, security, and all this kind of stuff that you probably won't know about until you study all these things about processors and all this kind of stuff. It also tell, tells the CPU what to do. I mean, if it's gonna click, kill that process, if it's gonna do X thing. It controls like hardware software that layer in a certain way. It's also like, I mean, it's a, it has a GPL 2.0 license, so it's gonna be called open source and it's open source. And I forgot to tell you, the pets of GNU is the GNU, as you can see there, and the pet of Linux is the Tux, which was, I don't know who gave him the, the name Tux to the pet, but it was cool because I think, I believe it was found in an FTP, or at least that's what they say. GNU is like, as you can see, the big part, and then there's Linux, but they fit together. GNU also fits with other kernels there's, for example, a kernel that's been run by the Free Software Foundation. It's been built by the community. I mean, it's free software, so people can improve it, can can help in the development, which is called Herd. So we'll see also distros in the future with GNU Herd instead of GNU Linux. It's cool. They they exist already, but they are not 100% secure to use on a daily basis, like for example, GNU Linux. Here's a periodic table of the different GNU Linux distros. You have like Linux Mint, you have Debian, you have Ubuntu, Xubuntu, all this kind of distros. There's Debian, as you can see, it has the number two popularity, and it was built and it was and it born in 1996. The founder, who was the founder of Debian, it was Ian Murdoch. Uh, it was Ian Murdoch, and mm, the main features about Debian GNU Linux that I want you to learn are that it's community driven, it has over 1,000 volunteers all over the world for um, you, even you can be, for example, a volunteer for Debian, you can help in the translation, you can help in the web pages, you can help in packages, you can help in lots of things, if you're a developer, of course you can help. Obviously, you need to follow the guidelines and all this on all the stuff that's uh, quoted on their website and the conduct and shell conduct and all this kind of stuff, but you can help. So I invite you to look for it on the Debian website about different ways to contribute. There's also lots of packages. I mean, there, you are, there are over 5,000 packages that you can use in Debian GNU Linux. Uh, 5,000 packages is 
a lot. It's a lot. Most of them are maintained by the community, but believe me, 5,000 packages is a lot. And now you're probably asking, what's a package? I haven't heard that word before. I mean, what's that? A package is like the term software. It's a it's not software. Yeah, it's software. It could be called software. It's like the executable files you tend to download in Microsoft Windows. You click it, you install it. It's this, basically the same thing. And also, I chose Debian. I chose Debian because it's easy to use. So it's pretty cool. Now, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I have, you have lots of things to see. The first steps with Debian. The first steps with Debian are the different desktop environments. You can see in this picture you have GNOME, you have KDE, you have X XFCE4, you have LXDE, which is a lightweight desktop. It's really awesome for, for example, old machines too. So it's pretty cool. You have even made, you have lots of desktop environments. And now you're asking, if I choose one, do I have to stay with one of these desktop environments or what's a desktop environment? In Windows, you are tied up to the same desktop environment. I mean, you can change anything. Or you can change things, but not everything. On GNU Linux, you can change everything. You can be a GNOME user, you can be a KDE user, or you can be a GNOME and KDE user. You don't have to be uh, tied up to one of those desktop environments. You can use two, three, you can use whatever you want. That's freedom. And that's a really cool thing about Debian. You have freedom. You can choose, you can choose which, whatever desktop environment you want. I'm going to talk later about how to install Debian in a virtual machine and you'll see you can choose whatever desktop environment you want. It's according to you. You decide. It's, it's your feeling, it's your taste, let's say. Now we've got also several things in Debian on in almost um, in GNU Linux distros. We have a term that's called the users. Obviously as in Windows you have the local and administrator and that's it. Uh, or at least on a daily basis. Then you have in Debian, you have like the root user. I draw, and there's a, I didn't draw it. There's a really cool penguin, which is the crown. Yeah, it's a root user. The root user has the power to do whatever he wants. He is the one that manages the system. For example, you have a home computer, you have your house computer or your, your home computer in your, in your living room. So imagine the root user would be like, your father or your mother, the one who controls that computer and knows what to install and what to don't install. He's the only one that can do things. The rest of them can't do anything. I mean, yeah, they can browse, they can watch videos, they can do that kind of things, but they can't install things. They are like the others are regular users or they could be privileged users with pseudo permissions. What's a privileged user, a user with pseudo permissions? It's a regular user, but that has some more permissions. Imagine you want uh, your brother to be able to update and upgrade the system while uh, your sister or your, or your father or you, or you could only just uh, install software. It's basically uh, the same thing. That's why um, I, um, I put that in the middle of the root or regular user because it's not a fully root. It could have the same permissions as root user, but it's not the same as root. Root is like the god. The god of the, of the system is root user. So there could be only one. Now, let's see. When you open up the console, the first thing you'll notice is that there's a user, a host name, and a place where you are. You're probably thinking, what's the host name? I don't have any idea of what's the host name. I've seen consoles or movies like, I don't know, I've, like those hacking movies where you see a console pop up and they print Hello World like lots of times in a loop. A console consists of these things. The first word would be the user. I mean, it could be you, it could be root, it could be my father, it could be anyone. I mean, obviously, it's a user on that system. The second, the, then the host name. The host name. Imagine when you have several computers on a network, you'd like to each one of them to be a, a thing. For example, the living room computer would, could be the host name living room computer. The 
the university computer could be the university computer as a hostname to recognize them when you, for example, try to control it in a remote way because you can via a server, via SSH that I'm not going to show you in this video, you can control your computer remotely and you don't have to have, and you don't need any graphical interface. You could control it with your phone, like typing. It's pretty awesome. Debian and Ginger Linux are awesome. And also, there's like that kind of uh, wave, I don't know how to say it in English, which is the place where you are. If you are in your, in your, for example, let's see an, a real example. You are in your videos folder. That route would be slash home slash your username slash videos. Or if you are in your download, downloads folder, it would be slash home slash your username slash downloads. Or, and if you are in your desktop, what would it be? It would be slash home, slash your username, slash desktop. It's pretty simple and it's pretty intuitive once you use them. Anyway, you're going to learn more then when I show you the virtual box and I'm going to write some commands that are going to help you learn about several things. Now, how do you keep up updated in a Debian system? You can keep updated using two ways. You can keep updated using uh, the sudo apt update command, sudo aptitude update command, thanks to what? Thanks to what or how do those commands work? Those commands work thanks to mere uh, repositories. Repositories, what are repositories? Is like, imagine you have like, uh, it's like, yeah, imagine you have a place where all your files are. But obviously you're a company. I mean, you are not. You're, they are not your videos or your pictures. It's like where you have the software. Well, repositories are places where they have lots and lots and lots of software. It doesn't have to be just one software. It could be lots of them. And packages are that pieces of software. And that boxes of software are packages. Each software is a package. That's basically the point. And then there are mirror, mirrors. For example, you have here a building in Spain or in Portugal or wherever where you have some software. So if you live in the other, uh, in the other, if you live in another country far away, it's it's hard to connect to the network here, or at least it will take that time due to ping and all this network stuff. So if you have mirrors, are like copies of that repository all over the world. So there are mirrors. Like, for example, in each country, it could be like seven mirrors. It depends on the country, but there are lots of them. And during the installation of Debian, you'll see that it says, do you want to use a network mirror? You just click yes, and then you just need to choose what mirror do you want to use. For example, I use Spain, my student organization mirror, which is Libre Labo Feme, which is one of the, f which is really great. And it's one of the fastest in Spain. And then you could also use like the, instead of the command line where you need to write sudo apt update, if you are sudo, if you are root, you just write apt update or apt update. But if instead of writing that, you could also use the graphical tool, which is called Synaptic. Synaptic is a graphical tool that lets you manage all these packages. It's like using the command line, but graphically. Personally, I prefer to use the command line because I feel like I've got more control on what do I, or of what I'm doing. But you could also use the graphical tool if you if you really want to. I mean, it's perfectly cool. Now, how do you manage files? As I've told you, I was gonna show you some commands, and I'm gonna do it. You can change, you can uh, manage files in a very very easy way using commands. But don't worry, those commands aren't like those typical commands with slashes and all this kind of stuff in bots, games, and all this kind of stuff. They are pretty simple and they are very intuitive to learn. For example, move, as you can see in the slide, move is MV, MV. It's pretty simple. I mean, move, MV, in your head. I mean, it makes sense. Remove is RM. It's pretty simple too. And there are lots and lots and lots of these commands. So now I'm going to show you a bit about how do these commands work. Let me change this to so that you are able to see how do they work. Let me change this. Okay, let me change this to the VM. Okay, now we are in the VM. Uh, let's see if I can open the VM. Okay, I'm in the VM. Uh, great. Now I put input the password. Now here we are using uh, Debian. Here's the terminal ls, for example, to list files. Clear. Now, as I've told you, you could use, for example, the cp command to copy. Well, let's let's see first. 
the routes that you are able to go. If you write ls, which is list files, you'll see that you can go to the desktop, documents, downloads, music, pictures. Let's, let's go to the desktop. You are now under, this is the same as home and desktop. It's pretty simple. If you want to go backwards, you just write cd. What cd? cd is change directory. Just write cd and two dots. Two dots is like going backwards because one dot is the same directory. What do I mean when I say this? For example, suppose you create uh, you create something inside the desktop. Uh, inside the desktop, let's see desktop. Uh, nano is a text editor. You just click nano. Hello world. Hello world. Control O to save it. And now, as you can see, there's our hello world file that we just created. So now we go. We want to copy hello world to backwards so we just write hello world dot dot flash i believe it's that command let me check okay that's the command just write cp hello world dot dot slash and now suppose we want to copy hello world we want to move we want to copy that hello world in the same director but with the same name i mean we want to change that name we just say hello world hello world 2 ls that's it it changed it's pretty quick and simple you could also use the file, the files. I mean, you can also use this tool. You could, it's quick, it's simple. Imagine, hello world two. You just click it here, rename, click OK, and that's it. It's pretty quick and it's pretty simple. So now let's go backwards, backwards. And now let's get back with the presentation. Well, no, let, let me just show you first how to update so that you know how to, you can update using, now let's go to the sudo user. Okay, now I'm, uh, now I'm the root user, I'm in the family PC hostname, and I'm in the slash Ermatius, which is my username. So now to update, we just write or sudo apt update or apt update, never mind. Now it's as I've, as I've told you, these are the mirrors I've told you about in the, before, and it's reading really package list, all the packages are up to date. It's pretty cool, it's up to date. And they are an upgrade with the, uh, with the upgrade command. Now imagine you want to install the Synaptic, Synaptic, I believe it's written like that. Okay, Synaptic is set to manually install. So now let's open it. I don't, don't know if this is a command. Yeah, it's the command. Okay. Now, as you can see, you, you have all these packages here. You have all the repositories here. It's pretty quick and it's pretty simple to use. So now let's jump back to the presentation. Let's jump back. Okay, I'm here. Let's jump back to the presentation. Okay, everything's cool. Now let's jump back to the presentation. Yeah, here we are. Now let's meet some tools that you could use as an alternative to the typical software you tend to use in G in Windows. Sorry, I was gonna call GNG Windows. Email client. You're probably used to use the browser, but imagine you are a user that wants to use a desktop email client. You could use Thunderbird by run by Mozilla, or you could use Gary, used by uh, developed by GNOME or run by GNOME and also Elementary OS, which is another distro. Uh, Thunderbird is like more full of things. I mean, it's more developed in that way. I mean, it's it's older, but it has lots and lots of things. It has lots of plugins to encrypt emails. You can do lots and lots of things with Thunderbird. And there's Gary too. Gary is cool too, but uh, it has a more simple design. It's different. It's, but both are pretty awesome. Then, if you want to just use an online mail app, like for example, you usually go to ProtoMail or Gmail or whatever mail you have, you could use the Nextcloud mail app. You could set up your mail there and you don't need to go outside of your Nextcloud mail app. It's pretty simple, pretty cool. And you can do lots of things. Like for example, when someone sends you a PDF, you can make a flow in Nextcloud that changes that PDF, that, makes that PDF, go into another folder and delete that the email, for example. Then, an alternative to the Adobe products. So an alter as an alternative to Adobe products, you have GIMP run by GNOME, you have Krita GNOME, run by KDE, you have lots and lots of things. Uh, by I, I personally use GIMP. You have lots and lots and lots of documentation on their official website. It's amazing, it's really cool, and I really, I really like GIMP. It's a, it's a pretty cool software. And there's also Krita. Krita is run by KDE, as you can see that logo. And 
it's more similar to an Adobe Photoshop, I believe. I didn't use it that much, but it's like more similar to Adobe Photoshop. Then you've got, if you want to work in vectors, you have the Inkscape. Inkscape is a typical program to both Windows and GNU Linux, so I won't talk a, bit, a lot about it. I mean, it's cool, it's Inkscape. And then you've got different video tools to substitute to their Sony Vegas Pro, Camtasia, all this kind of primitive software that you know what that you don't know what's running behind. They could be stealing your data. We don't know. We don't know what's running behind. So you could use KDE and Live, which is run by KDE, obviously, by the name the name says it. And you or you could run OpenShot. OpenShot, it's also open source. So both of them are open source, both of them are pretty awesome, pretty cool. And they are simple, they are not that simple to use, but you could learn, and it's open source, so you know what's running behind. It's in, give it a shot. I mean it's cool. Then you've got the syncing with your phone. Imagine you are using your computer and you wanna use the typical thing of copy and paste from your phone to your computer. Perhaps you use the typical Telegram app and you go to save messages and you just write it there copy it on the PC, and that's it. Well, with KDE Connect, you don't have to do anything of that. I mean, you can control your phone or you can control your PC using the your PC or your phone. It's pretty, it's a pretty mix of words, a pretty mix of words, but it's pretty, it's pretty cool. You can, I don't know, you can write commands, you can ping to see if the computer is there, you can do lots and lots of things. And even you, you can even control the multimedia, which is an awesome thing, or your presentations, which is also a cool thing to do. Then you've got, like for example, Hoplin. Hoplin is a note editor. Uh, it's like a note client, a notes client. You could use it with the next cloud. You could use it in a terminal, uh, in a terminal way. You could use it in many, many things. Hoplin. It's pretty cool. But there are lots and lots of open source kind of apps to notes, calendar, all this kind of thing. There are lots of them. And for backups, I tend to suggest our clone. Why our clone? Our clone can sync with Google Drive, you can sync with Nextcloud, you can sync with Dropbox, you can sync with lots of things. I always suggest Nextcloud because I mean it's the, free, it's the open source one, the free software one. But if you use uh, the other ones, you could use it as well as with the other ones. I mean, you can even you can encrypt before uploading things to the cloud, which is a, a good way to to say to see that your data is safe. And then we've got Nextcloud. What's Nextcloud? I really love Nextcloud. Nextcloud has an HGPL v3 license. What do I mean? It's free software. As it says there in the slide, it's free as in freedom. Nextcloud is also multi-platform. You could use it on your phone, you can use it on your computer. There's there are desktop apps for your phone. There are desktop apps for your computer. There's also a mobile app for your phone. Whether you run Android, you run EOS, you could use it. And you can also use it on your browser. You do not depend on these kind of things. What do you typically need to set up Nextcloud? You typically need a web server or a database. A web server, I usually suggest a patch web server, or a database, I usually suggest MariaDB. But in this demo, we'll see how to run Docker. What's Docker? Docker is when it's like a box where you run uh, things inside of it. It's like a virtual machine, but in a different way. It's more a box. It's everything you do inside that container won't affect what's on the outside. More or less, it's that same concept. How do you run a container? First, you need to install Docker then you need to run that command. So now it's demo time. We'll learn how to run Docker and how to install that container to run it and to see how Nextcloud works. So now let's go again to our VM, which we were seeing before. Okay, now we are, we are on our VM. Let me just put it here, okay. Now let's go to our browser. We got here the web browser. Okay, here we are. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna go is to DuckDuckGo.com. Now I'm gonna search for the Docker wiki install on Debian. Okay, so now here we've got the install Docker engine in Debian. Now we click there and it takes a bit of time to load, but it will load. Uh, anyway, while we are working on this, okay, now, yeah, okay, it's cool, it's cool. As you can see, the first step is installed using the repository. 
As I told you about, in the repositories there are packages, and repositories, repositories are in different can, in different mirrors all over the world, so that you can download things without having to wait that much. So how do we set up that repository? We need to update our packages, as I told you before, to update it using that apt update. Uh, we just need to write here apt update. Okay, we click enter. It's uh, trying to update. Uh, as I've told you, my network speed is not that fast. So let's wait until it updates. And then what we have to do is to install these things. The APT transport, HTTPS, the CA certificates, cool. I'm not gonna explain what's in, what's each one of these because we are running a bit out of out of time. But anyway, I'm gonna show you how to do it. We just click, we just copy it, paste it, and that's pretty simple. I mean, I believe on those things because I know what's in each of these things. And now we need to add the Docker's official GPG key. I'm not going to explain either what's a GPG key because I'm just gonna tell you. It's like a safe method that to know that you are downloading something from the official repository. I mean, you are not, uh, there's no one in the middle trying to change that software for you to install like some kind of malware or some kind of, all those kind of things. Now we need to add the repository. We just click copy paste, okay. And now we install the our Docker engine. Okay, paste it. Couldn't find. Okay, you see, I forgot to do an update. Let's do an update, and then okay, now it's taking them from Docker. Now we just run it. Okay, yes, I want to install them. It's probably going to take some time, but I'm gonna show you how. After this, you should run the command I showed you in the slide, which is the command, but. As I don't have that much time, I'm gonna show you how to run, uh, how a Nextcloud instance can run. I mean, how, how it runs, how is it cool. I'm gonna use my student organization instance. So wait, hold on a second. I'm gonna just use the password. I'm just gonna input the password for you to see how it works. Okay, hold on a second. Here it is. Okay, that's cool. We log in. And, okay, I wrote the wrong username and the password, I don't know why, what? Okay, wrong username and password, let me try again with my username. Okay, now I'm in. It took a bit of time. Okay, now it's opening. It, it probably takes a little bit of time sometimes. Okay, now as you can see, I've got like lots of documents, let me change. The display fast. Let me change a bit the display because I didn't change it before. Okay, apply. Okay, here it's here it is. It's way much better for you probably. Okay, now you can see all these kind of things. This is my own cloud. I can create a new document that's called I don't know, uh, hello world at devconf. Devconf. Uh, it's creating it or did I click? Okay, yeah, it's cool. If not. I'm gonna use just use one of these. It probably takes some some time because I'm in a foreign country and I don't have that much network speed. But it's gonna take it takes it takes a while to load. Let me check. Let me let's see how our Docker instance is running. Okay, right now it didn't it didn't work. But I'm gonna show you some notes. For example, here you could write your own note. Hi, Devcon, twenty twenty. And here you could write like, hi, if this is a markdown, I believe, yeah, it's a markdown, hello world, hello world. This is like notes, you can sync, sync them with your phone, for example, here's the calendar, you just click on calendar. And here, as you can see, you've got like different different days, you just click here, you just need to, to add an event, even title, you can have even different kinds of calendar, here you can have all your contacts, I mean, you can sync the Nextcloud app with your phone, which is a pretty cool thing to do. I mean, it's your own cloud. You can do whatever you want. I mean, it's your own cloud. Just be sure to be updated in a way that's pretty safe. Now it's starting. It's taking a little bit to load because of my again because of my network speed. And uh, here we can add, for example, let's see a new contact. I'm gonna call him, for example, Kevin. Okay, it doesn't let me write right now. Uh, home, we can write here the phone number, we can write lots of things, I mean you can even have groups 
we can even import our contacts with our that, that are from our phone you can select a file you can import them one great benefit you are used to you you are used to typically talk using gt google meet all these kind of tools now you can use your own instance tool which is talk with talk you could you can call as you can see i've called myself you can call people and you can talk with them you can assign them to projects in the next cloud and you can do lots of things for organization for organization this is great here you have photos activity but why as i told you i want to show you some things that are pretty awesome uh, let's see here you can add mm, your personal details but let's go to i believe okay i don't know here you have also the users okay i can't see it because i'm not an administrator as you can see mm, what i was going to tell you is in your next cloud instance you can have different groups you can have for example a group that's an administrator that has a limit up to 50 gigabytes for example and on the other hand you can have regular users which is their limit it's like i don't know 10 gigabytes you can also filter by ip address what uh, what people can download this is good for example when you want to share like a file that can only be seen by certain people in a restricted using a restricted vpn for them to see or if you live in a house or if you live, or in your home you could just restrict that file to be accessed inside your home not outside using that ip or for example you could just restrict a file to be used in a geographical zone area that would be weird yes but some people want to do it you could do it you can also you can do really lots of stuff R lots of lots and lots and lots of stuff plus there are over i believe it's 500 different kind of extensions that you can install contacts mail calendar notes are just one of the simpler ones that are in the next cloud is instance but there are lots of them and you as i've told you you for example can share links with others you can share an internal link and you can even create a project and add into a project for example let's call it uh, my session is level with me there is no project but if it's if it were it would be it would be linked or you can even link it to a conversation or to a file so here you can share it with others you can do lots and lots and lots of stuff and you even can be searched for other versions you can add tags you can add a tag that's convert to pdf and when you upload that file it's gonna convert it to a pdf i mean you have lots and lots and lots of things to do i'm just gonna take this last minute to see to share with you a project that we are developing we are developing a project that consists of a cloud among universities and schools and high schools first we are the step one is across universities that in which students can share the notes they take in their classrooms in a open source and free way they don't have to give their data to third-party providers and all these kind of people that just want their data they give them money but you give them your data i mean they, they sell your data it's it's not ethical i believe and plus in this way of sharing uh, notes in this free way in the next cloud we are also checking in the permissions of the files for example if you share the notes that the teacher gave you we need like to have like the permission from the author either by a license or any kind of stuff that says you have the right to upload that thing to this website so everything will be cool everything will be safe and everything will be legal and ethical because uh, everything will be cool i mean we won't sell your data we promise so if you want to keep uh, involved in our projects or in that project you just need to search for us and yeah that's cool you can contact us in mastodon matrix we even have our own instance telegram whatever social network you want to contact us and that's basically it i hope you enjoyed i hope you liked uh, this small introduction to gnu linux in education and i hope you really use nextcloud because the last step would be to run the container you could try it it just run the command click next click install and it was really such an honor to be here at devconf 2020 today with you and i hope you learn more and more and more about this world every day and so that you are able to see all the other talks uh, after this one uh, thank you so much for listening and if you want to contact me here you've got my social networks so be safe
stay safe and have a nice day. you learn how to how to develop for that thing and you also know how to use that thing in a better way plus obviously it's like the story of how everything began begin so i think it's really something that should be taught at schools and colleges just to make the users know that there's more than like that that microsoft windows stuff that people used to know and just i mean they don't know the alternatives so yeah awesome cool um I just said thank you. Thank you a lot for your talk. It's very inspiring, motivating. Um, what do you consider the main obstacles in Spain currently for universities and schools to uh, do uh, to do? Uh, to not use more free software in their classes with the students and also with the administrative staff. I believe the main obstacle, as I've said, is like the, the, the first step would be the government. I mean, the government tends to suggest proprietary software, proprietary software, instead of free software. So then in the high schools and colleges, at least from what I've heard, they tend to like believe on those recommendations and not try to use different software. So um, that could be like the first step to share the campaign, public money, public code, and all these campaigns about universities from the Free Software Foundation, and also try to suggest teachers and students about the different alternatives, not just let them work with like, for example, visual code, like for example, at my college, but let them know that there are different alternatives and they can use whatever they want because they should be at least free. I mean, if they wanna take a responsibility for something, at least they, they, they should be able to. They shouldn't be like made in that box where they can't go out. Yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, okay, someone made a little comment. This talk will be very nice to newcomers. And uh, that, yeah, that's good. We're recording yeah. it. Um, do you, uh, this is, have you, uh, can, uh, so do you have a solution with GNU slash Linux for secure browser for test taking? Um, I don't or, have like, yeah, I, I, yeah. I don't have like that kind of solution. I mean, it's it's a very difficult topic because they need to like, at least yeah. to know what the student is going through. So yeah, it's a it's a hard thing to, it's a hard, really hard thing to do. I'm not in that area, so I don't know really what could be the best solution. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I really don't know uh, what to use in that case. Um, I'm a computer science student at the Institute of Mathematics and uh, at Statics at the Universidad de Sao Paulo. We've always had the Linux spirit. Our teachers were some of the, the first to install at, it at the universities. Nowadays, sadly, there are more and more Windows users each year here. We try to show how easy and marvelous Debian is, for example, but it's hard to change people's minds. What do you do to convince people to try Debian? I tend to let them know that most software they use, they don't know what they are using. I tend to, for example, share the articles of all the different things that proprietary software tends to, to show them. Also about the different things they can make in GNU Linux. I mean, obviously on Debian, they can do whatever they want. I always tell them that they can do whatever they want. They are not in that box where they can't do anything they they know what happens they can check logs they can check how everything is working from the base to the to the front end i mean they, they can do anything and they can check plus as someone uh, as not said is is expensive proprietary software is expensive if a high school instead of paying microsoft uh, licenses to all this kind of software 
try to use more of the free software of the free software they, they would really and they wouldn't spend that much money instead and users will be free i mean they they users really need to be free and students really need to be free and people need to learn that there's an alternative because when they are like young at younger ages they only know one thing that exists that is microsoft windows so if we share from an early age that there are alternatives and other things exist uh, people could try and use them but if we do if we do not show them from the early ages they will need to learn it by themselves but yeah i mean we should try and share, and share all this software with teachers when also at high schools because software exists and the students can use them Okay, um, there's, only, there's one last question here, we're already a minute over. Um, it doesn't seem to be, would you recommend Flatpak or Snap or App Image for the average user? I mean, for example, I didn't, I, Flatpak, I've used it like um, very few. I don't tend to recommend it because I didn't use it that much. I mean, people, people know more about them than myself. Uh, Snap, I think Snap, it's easy to use. And then App Image doesn't re really need an um, installation. So I, App Image would be an easy stuff and also Snap. I'm in between one of those. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you, Raphael, for your interesting talk. Thank you and so much. Also, very informative. I really like it. And I hope that you can really make a difference in your community and we can you know, keep going on with that. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.